I want you to watch more reality television. <laughs> and I want you to do that because I want you to experience the same joy that I get when I watch reality TV. <laughs> and that's not because I am a TV critic and a writer who focuses on reality TV and I just want to keep myself in business. It's because I actually think reality television is beneficial and that it's going to really change your life and change the lives of the people around you and potentially even change the world. I honestly think that reality TV and you will add joy to your life. <laughs> and I know this seems counterintuitive, and it might seem like the, wor the least thing you were thinking about reality television, like, no way is that going to make me in a smiley face. It's probably going to make me this face. <laughs> Sad baby. Because that's the way I think we think about reality television, is that it's something that is just the lowest form of culture and something we don't even really need to pay any attention to. But I think the opposite is actually true. I think in this particular form of nonfiction, we have a ton of possibility to both be entertained and to learn. So how did I get to this place? How did I get here arguing to you that reality TV, of all things, has value? Well, it all starts with this guy, <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Yeah, Mr. Rogers and I were really close friends when I was a kid. I had a great family, a great childhood, a wonderful sister and family around me, great resources, but I think I was kind of a lonely and sad kid, ultimately. But I turned on the TV every day, and this guy looked at me, and he talked directly to me. And that changed everything. I, I really think I developed a real friendship with him, even though we never met. He's dead now, but I kind of don't even think he is, because he's still alive on TV. I can just go watch him online, and there he is, just like he always was. In 1969, Mr. Rogers gave some testimony in front of the Senate to argue for funding of PBS, and he said this, I give an expression of care every day to each child. That is totally, absolutely true. Um, and he definitely was talking directly to me, and I know to many other people too, but mostly to me. <laughs> During that testimony, he also said this, I end the program by saying, you've made this day a special day by just your being you. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. That last part gives me chills, which is why I turned, changed it into a different color. <laughs> and really, even when I hear that now, even when I'm saying it, I go back and I turn into happy little kid Andy. <laughs> Thanks. It's <laughs> actually born in the late 70s. I don't know why this picture is black and white. But yeah, it did really improve my life to have a connection with someone on television. And I think it was a real genuine connection and one that I learned a lot from, whether it was about how crayons are made or whether or not I'm going down the drain, but mostly, <laughs> mostly about how I felt about myself and my self-esteem. I'm special and I matter. That was the message that Rister Rogers gave to every single kid who watched. And I think that that's a message that resonates today all over the place. And in fact, our world has become a way in which we can communicate that we're special and that we matter. We see that on Facebook, on Twitter, on reality TV. It's like Mr. Rogers predicted this, that someday everyone would be so special and matter so much that we'd have ways to express that constantly in real time as we were driving around using our phones. <laughs> Mr. Rogers was a genius, completely. He predicted all of that. So let's talk about television for a second, because Mr. Rogers really believed in the power of television, and television is still extraordinarily powerful. I think we think about other mediums that have been developed and kind of think that maybe no one watches TV anymore. In 2011, there was $72 billion spent on television advertising. 72 billion. Let's compare that to other media. Just 16 billion in magazines, 12 billion in newspapers. Look at internet down there, just 6 billion as a comparison. So clearly advertisers think it's still valuable and still a way to reach a mass wide audience. And I think Mr. Rogers saw that same potential in TV, that you could really reach a lot of people and connect to them. In 2011, on broadcast primetime TV, Nielsen found that 15.5% of people's viewing hours were of reality television might be smaller than you expect because dramas were actually more than twice that and sports a little bit more. But reality TV has now take, overtaken sitcoms, at least on broadcast primetime TV. And broadcast channels still have the potential to reach a huge audience, but a lot of the audience has migrated to cable where there are tons and tons of channels, often speaking to small niche audiences. 
and there's a lot of reality television there. Uh, my friend Aaron Barnhart, uh, for a story in, the two in 2010 um, for the Kansas City Star, wrote a, or counted literally the number of reality shows, which is an, an impossible task that one I've never even decided to attempt because it was so crazy. Counted 560. 90% of those are on cable. 560, look at all that possibility that's out there. And you probably think it's possibility for crap, but it's also possibility for such good and such strength. For example, um, in 2010, 2011, uh, in that television year, 28% um, of broadcast primetime TV and 22% of advertising dollars were spent on programs that featured people of different sexual orientations than we're used to. And I think we can actually trace that directly back to reality television, believe it or not, that we can say that the world has been improving as a result of the example that reality has set. That goes back to 1973 and to an American family, which was really the first reality show. Some documentary filmmakers followed this family, the Louds around, and filmed them all the time. And among the cast members was their son, Lance Loud, who was television's first openly gay character. And he really paved a path for all the people that came after him. But more than that, I think American Family really surprised audiences and, and shocked people because it was, you were able to tune in every week and follow the lives of these families. It wasn't just a documentary where you watched it for two hours and it was there and gone, and that certainly has great value. But it was like watching a soap opera except with real people and real lives. Uh, Lance and, or excuse me, um, Pat and Bill, the parents, actually decided they were getting a divorce on camera, and that was something that a lot of people had never seen or experienced before. Flash forward a couple decades to 1992 when the real world debuted. Seven strangers having their lives taped, living in a house that they couldn't otherwise afford. This picture is of the Boston firehouse where the season um, set in Boston where they lived. When, when I went to Boston on an internship in college, this was the first place I went on the first weekend. I like made a pilgrimage to the real world house because I wanted to see exactly where they had filmed. And that was because I had actually developed a relationship with the people that I saw on television. And I really liked following their stories from week to week. And on the last episode, I remember actually getting teared up when they were saying goodbye to each other because I was having to say goodbye to friends of my own. And I, I think that reality television for me often provides a really safe way to have interaction with people who I wouldn't otherwise know and to meet people totally unlike myself and unlike anybody I encounter in my everyday life. And as a kid and as a teenager, I think I was able to see what the world was like as a result of the real world in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. In 2000, Survivor debuted. That changed everything for reality television because it taught broadcast networks and all television networks that reality TV would work. Um, it was a phenomenal runaway hit. You probably watched the finale with your family or friends. It was incredibly highly rated, more than any episode of American Idol has been ever was that finale. Um, in 2008, I got to go on location with Survivor and see how it was produced. I was in the African nation of Gabon. Um, it's beautiful, as you can see, and on camera it looked amazing, and the contestants played their social game, which is kind of like a human game of chess. But what I was most amazed to see was something that I knew, but to actually see it in person was really shocking, which was how many people it took to make that show happen. Survivor has a crew of 350 to 450 people, some of whom are locals, but many of whom come from all over the world to put this show together. When they're on a beach doing a challenge, there are about 75 people standing there behind the cameras, watching them and supporting that process, whether they're filming or doing audio or our medical staff. And it's incredible to think about how reality TV is constructed and how we actually respond to what we're seeing and why we're responding that way. So back to Mr. Rogers. Also in that 1969 testimony, he said this, we deal with such things as the inner drama of childhood, we don't have to bop somebody over the head to make drama on the screen. So I think that Mr. Rogers definitely believed in the power of television, but he also knew that we didn't have to let it reach our basest and lowest selves in order to really grab people's attention. He believed and trusted that reality television had power, that his self as a real person on TV could actually reach kids. And I think we need to have that same kind of trust in the television that we watch. There are two, two kinds of trust there. The first is just that we need to be able to trust that what we're watching is actually real. 
And the second is that if you're going on a reality show, you need to be able to trust the producers who are making it to have your best interests in mind, to keep you safe emotionally and physically and otherwise, but give you a great experience you wouldn't have otherwise, like being able to fly halfway around the world and play a social game unlike no other. So I think trust is important because it's what really sets reality television apart from fiction. I love fiction, I watch Mad Men, I watch all kinds of shows all the time. I was a big fan of Seinfeld and back when I was a kid, The Golden Girls. And those shows are fantastic, but when you watch them, you know that they're actors. You know that they're reading someone's words. You know that they're in a fake house, in a fake set, and that it's not real. Reality television has a different contract with the audience. It says, this has consequence to real people. What we're doing here is something that will affect real lives, and it's something that you could actually do. That's what allows for connection to form. That's what allows us to say, ah, I identify with that person, or no, I don't. I don't understand what's going on at all. But it's really great to be able to form connections with people who we might not have otherwise encountered. If you're watching an episode of Hoarders and you're seeing evidence of mental illness and a mental disorder in front of you, you're understanding what it's like to have that disease in a way that you couldn't unless you knew somebody. But if you did know somebody who had that or you yourself might be suffering from it, now you're actually seeing someone who's just like you and maybe you can find help for that or maybe you can find resources. That kind of connection can also form between us as viewers. We can go on Twitter and Facebook and talk about what we see, and we can talk to our actual friends in real life too. That would be surprising, wouldn't it? Talk to people in real life. <laughs> Call people on the phone or sit and actually watch a television show with someone and, and see what happens. And we form bonds over our entertainment, even our entertainment that features real people. The problem with this though, is that reality television can also reach down to our lower, baser selves and cause disconnection. It can cause us to unplug. I love how the empty plug is basically a horrified looking face. <laughs> because it says like, I need something here, give it to me. I need it, and you've taken it away. <laughs> Reality television is such a huge genre, there is so much range, and I think a lot of times we just lump it all together with the bad stuff and just say this is all it's going to ever be. But it can go from the best kind of documentaries or the best kind of competition shows all the way down to the stuff that we might not want to watch. But we definitely don't want to get disconnected from the fact that we're watching real people and that we might have an impact on their real lives and how we actually deal with them. I'm not always proud of the way that I've dealt with reality show cast members. I think that I've probably been really mean and cruel sometimes in my responses, whether on Twitter or in the longer pieces that I've written. And I've had some chance to get to know people beyond what I've seen on the screen and had to remind myself that what I'm seeing on screen is just a fragment of their lives and I need to have that kind of understanding. So I want you to tune into reality TV and look for kinds of connections that you can form. And I want you to see more of those in your lives and see how it can enrich your lives. But I also want you to change the way that you watch reality television if you currently do or once you start, because I know you're going to. And I'm gonna give you a really simple way to do that. The friend test. <laughs> now I've illustrated it here with this picture of two really cute sleeping kittens because I think if any, the internet has shown us anything, it's that we can really um, all rally around the fact that kittens are cute. <laughs> and the, the, that's the one thing we can all agree on, or, or most of us, I guess, unless you're a sociopath of some kind. <laughs> so what's the friend test? The idea is that when you watch a show, I want you to think about the people you're seeing and imagine that they're your actual real life friends. They're people you know and deal with every single day. How does that change how you feel about them? Are you laughing with them? Are you learning from them? Are you experiencing alongside them? Friends can get angry at each other, and friends can be upset and hurt and frustrated with each other, and friends can also feel betrayed, and so I think that can happen. We can wonder why someone made the decision they did. But we also then consider when there are friends, what comes behind that? We have empathy for their situation. We have empathy for how they got to the point that they were at. And I also want you to think about the fact that are your friends being held up for ridicule on TV? Have they been turned into objects by reality show producers or networks who just think of them as playthings just to hold them up for our derision? And are we just playing along there? There's no fun at all in treating people like objects. Instead, we need to find the joy that we can have in human connection. People's lives are really interesting and we can learn so much from them. 
Finding that joy, I think, is in every single reality show. We can also find that connection in our daily lives with our friends and family, in our communities, but I really hope you also find it from your friends on reality TV. Thank you.